Okay, good morning. So now we look at the significance of the isolation of Canada from another site, the respiratory tract. So uh, the simple answer is that we shouldn't treat Canada from sputum or ETT or BAL. And these are the reasons and I'll go through them one by one. First, that Canada can be grown from the mouths of healthy persons and a large variety of patients, whether or not they have pneumonia. Secondly, there are good autopsy studies uh, which show that there is no correlation between pre-mortem isolation of candida from the respiratory tract and histopathological evidence of candida pneumonia. Three, there are good observational studies that also show no correlation between a positive candida culture from the respiratory tract and clinical outcomes. And finally, someone has actually done an RCT showing no benefit in treating a positive respiratory tract culture growing candida. So first of all, uh, as we have heard uh, multiple times, uh, candida is thought to be a, norm a constituent of the human microbiota. And uh, there are many, many terms that are used, and, and actually I don't know which is the best term, and the literature doesn't know either. Uh, is it a contaminant? And contaminant means it is something extraneous. It's an artifact of sampling. It shouldn't, shouldn't be there, really. Is it a commensal? A commensal uh, is benign, but it is native to the human host. The commensal benefits from, but doesn't harm the host. Or is it a colonizer? A colonizer is almost the same. It is able to multiply in or on the human. Uh, it doesn't harm the host, but it is actually not native to uh, the human. And finally, is it a pathogen? Yeah, of course it is. Uh, sometimes. So uh, the, the long and short of it is that there is no culture-based or molecular test of respiratory specimens that can distinguish between contamination, colonization, and invasive disease. And as we heard from Dr. Chakrabarti this morning, uh, studies of the microbiome now suggest that uh, perhaps uh, what we eat will determine the type of uh, fungi in our gastrointestinal tracts. Now, we all know the categories of patients in whom we are likely to see oral trash. I mean, from the earliest days uh, in medical school, we have already been taught that diabetics, for example, patients on steroids, patients on broad-spectrum antibiotics, uh, patients in the ICU, uh, it's quite common to see them with oral trash. It's quite common to, to pick up candida in their oral uh, flora. So this is where it started uh, many years ago, more than 50 years ago. Uh, an investigator uh, cultured the sputum and looked for candida in these three categories of patients, uh, three categories of people, patients, hospital employees, as well as students. Don't you wish you live in that era? You can just culture sputum and publish in the New England Journal of Medicine. But what is significant is not that... Uh, uh, not, not who, you know, who, had, who was more likely to have candida, but the fact that it grew at all in all these uh, groups of, of persons that he studied. And among the hospital employees and students, of course, no one was on antibiotics. So fast forward to the 21st century, and now you have to do a study in a more rigorous manner to, to get published. But here is another look at candida. Right? So they, they looked at uh, candida in the mouth and tried to compare it with the lower respiratory tract. They're very ingenious in getting, health, the, getting into the lower respiratory tract of healthy persons. Right? They looked at healthy persons going for plastic surgery and they, they, they sucked it out uh, from the lower res respiratory tract during the time that they were intubated under general anesthesia. Of course, there's a very long list of exclusions to make sure that they actually had a very healthy group of people. And as you can see, uh, you can find candida in the mouth even of healthy persons. Uh, of course, not to mention uh, patients who were in the ICU, whether or not they had antibiotics, whether the infection was a pulmonary infection or an extra pulmonary infection. So lots of candida everywhere. Now, this is a modern study, so they went on to do sequencing, and basically, uh, uh, they were able uh, to come to several conclusions. 
that uh, there was no candida in the lower respiratory tracts of healthy persons, uh, nobody who had candida in the oral flora or even in the lower respiratory tract actually developed an invasive fungal infection or a candidemia. And uh, because they were able to do sequencing, they were able to show that there was no correlation between a candida-dominated uh, lower respiratory flora and 30-day mortality. So that's another reason not to, to go about treating a candida that grows out of the ETT. Okay, so is there such a thing as a candida pneumonia? Well, look at this uh, post-mortem study. Uh, this is a very good study. They managed to get 25 patients who were dying in ICU, they excluded people uh, who were immunosuppressed, and basically the moment they died, uh, you know, uh, they gave 100% O2 and then tried to get samples from as many sources as possible, not only ETT, but also open lung biopsy or elithoroscos thoracoscopic biopsy. And, and out of these uh, patients, 40% actually grew candida from a lung biopsy, biopsy specimen. And that's very significant because we always say when you biopsy an organ, uh, it should be sterile, right? But not the lung. The lung is an exception, right? So if you look at all these people, uh, uh, these patients had pneumonia, you know, on histopathology, and about half, more than half of them grew candida from the lung biopsy, but only one had a candida pneumonia. And of those without pneumonia, uh, even then half grew candida, right? So candida, uh, the fact that you get candida doesn't seem uh, to correlate with the true histopathological picture. And only one person had histopathological evidence of candida pneumonia. Candida pneumonia means you must have invasion and lots of white cells, etc. And in this person, actually, the diagnosis would have been made easily. Uh, a pre-mortem uh, blood culture was actually positive for the same candida cruzii. And so you can see here that the candida was also uniformly uh, distributed, right? Uh, whether you, you, uh, uh, it was a blind biopsy or whether it was a guided biopsy in an area, in an area that had, uh, that, whose CT scan had, had something on it, uh, made no difference. There was candida everywhere. So this is another uh, post-mortem uh, study. Again, uh, they looked at all these persons. Uh, this is... Uh, one of one, Dutch, I think, uh, high rate of autopsies in the ICU. So there were people with no pneumonia. Okay, so the study stopped there. Of those who had pneumonia, uh, there were people whose uh, respiratory sample had candida, but there was no candida pneumonia. Of patients uh, whose respiratory sample did not have candida, of course, there was also no Candida pneumonia. So the f whether or not you get candida uh, doesn't, doesn't mean anything. Okay, this is another uh, interesting uh, paper. This is a, a correlation between what, what you do in the laboratory and what the clinical outcomes are. So in this early period, I think this is the University of Southern Illinois. Uh, in this first period, they were very aggressive whenever they had fungi growing from a respiratory tract specimen, they would speciate it to genus, to Canada uh, uh, species level, and then report a uh, full, uh, give a full report, right? And, uh, but if there was a mixed culture, then they would just say presumptive Canada albicans. But after a certain date, they decided that if they grew a yeast, all they needed to do was to rule out uh, cryptococcus, and then report it as a yeast without actually using the word candida. And look at it. So in the before and after uh, periods, first of all, there was no difference in mortality, and that's the critical finding. But you find that at the time when the, they limited their reporting, the length of stay actually became shorter. Uh, the cost of hospitalization declined, and of course, there were fewer patients receiving antifungals. And if you were worried, you know, about all these, uh, why, why aren't we treating all these things, then the, the proof is that there was no difference in mortality anyway. 
So this is another study. They also looked at uh, outcomes uh, between people who had pneumonia or people who had no pneumonia and whether uh, people who grew candida or no candida and whether or not uh, antifungal treatment was given, right? So whether uh, you, were in the, you were given antifungals or whether you were not given, the outcomes were the same. So the other thing is uh, uh, patients with intensive care uh, pneumonia. This was a prospective study. They looked at the teaching hospital and they, they, they followed all these patients uh, for outcomes, right? So this is a crucial, uh, crucial thing. Whether or not, uh, well, it, it, you, those who were more sick uh, tended to have more candida, but uh, whatever it was, whether or not there was candida in the, in, the, in, in the ETT, it made no difference to all these various uh, measures of clinical outcome, like how long you stay in ICU or, or, or how long you stay in the hospital. Right? And, and this is just uh, uh, what they did uh, uh, represented graphically. Okay, now uh, we look at... Uh, yeah, that was the conclusion, sorry. All right, now we look at an RCT. So this is a, a, a randomized controlled trial, very rigorously conducted, I must say. It's prospective, it's multi-center, it's placebo controlled. They even had matching placebo. Everybody got started on, on uh, anidular fungin. Uh, they could be switched to fluconazole if it was an albicans. And, and basically, these are the outcomes. Right, so, so the mortality was not different whether you took 28 day or 90 day mortality and of course all these other parameters were also not different. Then they, they also tried to measure things like procalcitonin and CRP and, and of course uh, procalcitonin and CRP did fall but they fell in all the groups. I mean these people were being treated for bacterial infections or we were being managed for trauma. So as the days went by, you would expect CRP and Procal to come down anyway. So in summary, it's not necessary. In fact, it is, it is important not to go about treating candida that you isolate from the ETT of uh, our per persons for these reasons, right? Candida can be cultured from the oral cavity of healthy persons. Uh, sequencing studies show that even when candida is dominant in the lower respiratory tract, there is no association with clinical outcome. Uh, we know now from observational studies that whether or not an ICU patient grows candida, uh, it has no correlation with clinical outcome. The autopsy studies which show that it's actually very rare to find a case of candida pneumonia in people who have candida cultured from the ETT. And of course, there's one RCT that has shown no benefit in treating candida culture from the respiratory tract with antifungals. Okay, thank you.